All right. Well, welcome everyone to our digital lecture tonight. Um, and we're going to get started right now. So my name is Dana Thorne and I'm the Curator Supervisor at Lambton Heritage Museum in Grand Bend. I want to let everyone know that I'm going to be recording uh, the lecture and putting it on the Lambton Heritage Museum YouTube channel. So um, if you have to step away, you miss something or or if you really enjoy everything tonight, you want to share it with a friend, um, it will be available online after the presentation. So you'll be able to check that out. This is the first in a series of four digital lectures um, that the museum is going to be hosting over the next four months. All of the lectures are connected with the theme of photography. This complements the feature exhibit we currently have at the museum called Capturing the Moment Photography in Lambton County. Um, you can book a time to come to the museum to learn about the history of photography from our local perspective. Uh, you'll see prints that show the evolution of pictures from daguerreotypes to cabinet cards to modern photographs. And we have a variety of antique camera equipment on display as well. In the, this first of our four part series, we welcome photographer Richard Belland. He's a music photographer based in Toronto and a professor at Lambton College. I wore my tragically hip shirt tonight after I saw Richard's pictures of Gord Downey with that fabulous feathered hat and his sparkly suit that became so iconic after their final tour. Um, in addition to photographing the tragically hip, Richard's work dates back to 1986. He photographs both live performances and studio portraits and has captured both Canadian icons and international superstars. Especially in this year where we've been robbed of live music experiences, I'm so pleased to welcome Richard tonight and learn a bit more about what happens behind that camera. If you have any questions as Richard's speaking, you can put them in the chat or in the Q&A and we will address those questions at the end of the presentation. So Richard, thank you so much for joining us. I'm looking forward to your presentation. Um, you can share your screen and take it away. Okay. All right. Can you just confirm that you can see that please? Okay. Fantastic. All right. Well, uh, just before I get started, I just want to say thank you to Dana and a big thank you to the Lambton Heritage Museum. Um, it, I'm truly grateful uh, for being asked to take part in this series. And um, uh, the Lambton Heritage Museum, if you've never visited before, I really highly recommend it. Uh, we bring our students there every year. And um, especially if you're from the area, it's a really great place to go visit. So uh, thank you. And then thank you to everybody who, uh, who decided to spend the next hour with us. Uh, I know your time is valuable and I'm really grateful that you decided to spend your time with us. So thank you. Um, one of the challenges for tonight for me was trying to stuff 30 years into uh, 45 minutes. So uh, I'm not going to give too much of an intro. I'm just going to jump right into it and get rolling so I can try and get through as much as possible. Uh, so sit back and enjoy. Uh, I thought first I should pay tribute to uh, how I or why I even got into this uh, career. Um, I grew up in Brights Grove, Ontario. Uh, probably a handful of you know that. And uh, just growing up in Brights Grove, you know, we're in close vicinity to Detroit and uh, listening to the Detroit radio stations um, for all those years really got turned on to uh, rock and roll music at an early age. And I'm sure there's a handful of my friends out there that uh, you know who you are. I, I definitely owe a lot to uh, friends who um, also turned me on to music. And also when I was a kid, uh, looking at rock and roll magazines, uh, that was another thing. I, I would see all these incredible photographs and I was already into the music and looking at the photographs, I just thought, wow, that looks like a pretty cool job. And uh, Bob Gruen um, was somebody that uh, was one of the ones that I really, really paid attention to. And I still do. And you can see a picture of Bob and I up there. I actually got to meet Bob a, a couple times over the years now. And uh, these are just a couple of his iconic photographs. But same thing, he did a lot of live photography of all the big, big names. And he did a lot of portrait photography as well. So uh, I just thought, okay, this is something that maybe is worth pursuing. Um, one of the first concerts that I photographed, and, and in fact, it was probably the biggest first concert that I ever photographed was The Grateful Dead, uh, along with Tom Petty and Bob Dylan, and that was in uh, 1986. So that's how I get away with saying I've been doing this for over 30 years. Um, I didn't actually have a photo pass for this particular concert. Uh, the Grateful Dead, um, they were pretty laid back about recording their, their performances. Um, 
audio and video. So uh, I managed to just burn my camera in. No one said much about it. And uh, when I left and I got these photographs, I thought, oh, that, they, they're not terrible photographs. Maybe, uh, maybe this is something that um, I could possibly pursue. And uh, that particular concert was a big turning point in a lot of other ways as well. Uh, you know, musically, certainly, um, and culturally, it just really opened up my eyes to uh, the possibilities that there were just outside of Wright's Grove, knowing that there's a big world out there and it might be worth exploring. Uh, one of the bit, next big concerts I photographed was Neil Young, and that was at Cobo Arena in Detroit. Uh, my friends and I were off to Detroit. It felt like every week, and if it wasn't, it was every other week. But we were there a lot, seeing as many shows as possible. And uh, it was really just feeding that, uh, that rock and roll necessity. And um, uh, The Cure was another show I photographed in the early years. Uh, this would have been 1987, so that's the, the following summer after photographing The Grateful Dead. And you can see, um, you know, I think the photographs actually were pretty good, considering I hadn't actually studied photography yet. Uh, one of the very first shows I went to photograph was in Toronto. And on the way there, my friend and I actually stopped at the local college there, at Fanshawe College, and we went and talked to a photography professor. Uh, I didn't know who this person was. I just went in there and asked um, if they could give me some advice on settings for a concert. And uh, that was kind of my first introduction to it. Um, U2 in 1987 was a really big deal for me as well. And I think if I had to say where there was a, a true pivotal moment where I thought, okay, this is it, um, it, it probably was this concert. And that was on April 30th, 1987. And um, it kind of came full circle for me. And way it was full circle for the band as well because in 2017 they decided to tour the 30th anniversary of the Joshua Tree and I went out to the opening night and shot it for the Toronto Star and that was out in Vancouver uh, so 30 years down the road um, for the band and 30 years down the road for myself and um, the shot on the right that was from the 30th anniversary and the shot on the left was from the Pontiac Silverdome which is no longer um, U2 is an amazing band to photograph. U2 is an amazing band to go see live. Uh, if you've seen them, then you certainly know this. I've been very fortunate to photograph them, uh, I don't know how many times, but probably close to 10 times. Uh, one of the great, great moments was going to Sling Castle in Ireland. Uh, that's the photograph in the bottom right. Um, to say it was exhilarating was probably, uh, or is probably an understatement. Uh, when I looked back and I could see 80 or 90,000 people, um, it, was, uh, it was definitely exhilarating. And uh, if you own the video, you can actually see me in the video photographing it. So along the way now, um, I've photographed probably over 3,000 concerts. And I know that seems like a large number, but I think uh, by the time of this presentation, you'll, you'll see how it's possible. Uh, so I just kind of put together a, a handful of acts here uh, just so you can see the kind of the gamut, the range uh, of what I have photographed and from ACZC to ZZ Top and uh, most of these bands I photographed multiple times uh, from grunge to country uh, and photo photographing Nirvana was quite an event. That was, uh, that was while I was still in college actually studying photography and it was the day after my birthday so that was quite exciting. Uh, from rap to rock, classic pop to country rock. Uh, Tony Bennett was a great one. Um, Tony actually, uh, he, he purchased a couple photographs off me. And, uh, he sent me a personal letter, a personal thank you letter. Uh, very classy dude. Um, oh yeah, someone who dresses like a bat to another who's bitten the head off a bat. For some people, it's Halloween every day. Uh, Lady Gaga to David Bowie. David Bowie a, a bunch of times as well. The Stones and the Beatles. And these ones are important here too. Uh, the Stones and the Beatles. And um, uh, well, this Paul McCartney show, let's just mention that for a quick second there. That was in 1990. Uh, I was in Europe for a, a number of months at that moment. And that was the first time uh, Paul McCartney had played Liverpool in 11 years. Uh, so that was quite an event to be part of as well. And then from uh, The Who to Led Zeppelin. And um, so growing up, uh, Led Zeppelin was my, my number one favorite band. Uh, certainly The Who and Black Sabbath and 
uh, ACDC and just so many other bands um, rank up there as well, Van Halen and U2, but Led Zeppelin was my number one band as a kid. And I think when I was in high school, if you would have um, told me that someday I might meet Robert Plant and Jimmy Page, it was just one of those things that I would never have been able to wrap my head around. And eventually um, I did meet them and uh, I've been able to photograph them a number of times. Uh, it wasn't actually Led Zeppelin. I was a little too young uh, by the time Led Zeppelin had expanded. And of course, uh, hometown heroes, I think are always worth mentioning. And there's certainly a lot more that I photograph locally. Um, you know, I like to get out there and photograph these massive bands that, uh, you know, are world renowned, but I also like to uh, get out there and photograph my friends and local people whenever it's possible also. Um, and that is just as exciting and just as exhilarating as photographing uh, any sort of band. Uh, the act of just using my camera and being able to capture uh, uh, people, you know, that work in the music industry or in the case of Mike Stevens up there, he's playing. Um, and most of my, these bands around here, I, I photographed in concert as well. Uh, Corey James Mitchell, and then my friend Jeff Getty and his sister Romney Getty. And then uh, I thought, I just put this slide in here. Um, obviously, everyone's heard the news about Eddie Van Halen. And um, one of my friends said something to me yesterday, uh, you know, losing Neil Peart and Eddie Van Halen in the same year has been it's had a real impact and uh for guys my age uh it just moves us that further away from high school when you really think about it i feel like in some ways i really kind of hang on to those years and um and as you start to lose these people i guess you start to realize wow there is a bit of a divide from that time and uh, when i was putting these slides in here i never even realized this until i popped the dates in there but check it out uh, october 7th both of those were on october 7th and i believe that was uh, October 7th yesterday. So um, 15 years ago there for the Neil Peart shoot. That was incredible as well. Uh, I was invited out to Metalworks studio. Uh, they were re-recording. Oh, geez, I forget the song right now. One of their uh, Rush songs. And uh, uh, I was in the uh, room. Well, the, 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 they were re-recording the video for it and I was in the room while the video guys were setting up and I was setting up my camera equipment. I didn't pay much attention to what was going on. Uh, at some point, everyone had left the room except for Neil. And so it was just Neil and I in the room and uh, he was about to do his warm up, and the door was already closed. And so I, I, it was a really awkward moment because I thought I can't really get up and walk out the door. And so I just sat in there and for at least 20 minutes, Neil uh, was warming up and it was just him and I. And uh, yeah, another one of those moments where um, I don't think if, if you told me that I would have been able to put it together uh, years ago. Um, one of the things I want to mention is, uh, and Dana started off with this, uh, I, I do a lot of live photography, certainly, and I also do um, uh, portraits, uh, but there's a number of things that I do in the music industry. And I think it's worth noting, you know, uh, she also mentioned that I, I'm the coordinator for the photography program at Lambton College. And uh, I do get a lot of students that come through the program and they, oh, yeah, I want to shoot concerts. I want to shoot concerts. And um, for sure, shooting concerts is an amazing way to use your camera. Uh, but if you want to make a living at it, uh, I think one of the things you need to consider is that you have to expand um, within that particular industry and whatever you want to photograph um, uh, you need to be flexible within that industry and realize that if you actually want to make a living, um, you want to be able to do other things. Uh, so me working in the music industry has always been something that I wanted to do, but eventually I realized that you can't just make a living only from shooting concerts. So uh, certainly if you look over on the left, portraits uh, used for editorial. Uh, I've shot for lots of magazines over the years and doing publicity and album artwork, which is kind of the, the pinnacle of it all to see one of your photographs on an album. Um, working the corporate side of things is a really great way to kind of pay the bills, uh, meet and greets, and working as a stills photographer and videos, record releases. Um, often when a band puts out a new album, they celebrate it. And so you're invited to these uh, celebrations and work as a photographer. Uh, record presentations, once the records, you know, sell millions or, um, or more, they usually give them presentations and they hire photographers to that. Uh, and then I've worked as a venue photographer for a number of venues over the years. And then uh, the performance photographs, uh, they get a number of uses, editorial publicity, archival, and uh, the production company 
as well. So, um, you know, I've taken a bit of heat of, about this over the years uh, because I, I, I've said, if you really want to make it as a photographer, I do believe you need a formal education. And when I get the heat, they're like, oh, you're just trying to sell your program. But well, the truth is I do want you to come study photography at Lambton College, but I was saying that long before I was teaching at Lambton College. If you, if you really do want to uh, make it as a photographer, I think um, a formal education is the way to go because you learn to be versatile within, uh, within that actual art. And I guess that's for anything you do. Um, having a higher education certainly helps. Um, so when I was putting this together and trying to figure out how I could put 30 years into uh, 45 minutes, I thought I'll just kind of touch on the pinnacles, the things that really helped me move forward, maybe the stepping stones, I could call them. Uh, if you look over in the left, the Syndicated International Network was a, a photo agency I worked for for, for a lot of years, um, the acronym SIN. And uh, it was really great. They were located in, or they, yeah, they were located in London, England. And uh, so for me, it was really amazing to be able to go over to this big city and shoot for them in the night. And uh, uh, it got to the point um, where I, I, was doing really well with them. And uh, the photo editor there was Canadian. So she was quite kind to me, I think just because we had that Canadian kinship. And uh, she would deploy me out to these uh, concerts um, around Europe. So it was, uh, it was definitely very exciting. And, um, you know, many of the shows were in London for sure. Uh, and in the daytime, uh, I would deliver packages for them. This was long before the internet. So I really got to know London well, and I got to know all the record labels and all these different magazines because in the daytime, I was the delivery guy. Uh, and then in the nighttime, I would go shoot concerts and I would live in this dingy little motel that would cost 30 pounds a night or something like that. But uh, 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 it really opened up uh, a lot of great opportunities for me. Uh, the Glastonbury Festival is a big one. Um, I shot the Glastonbury Festival 11 years. Uh, so there's one of the ways that I was able to get a lot of bands because you could photograph uh, 30, 40 bands in a, uh, three days there. And I just put in this David Bowie shot because that was definitely one of the highlights of my 11 years at the Glastonbury Festival. Uh, photographing Ozzy and Black Sabbath, the OzFest. This is when Black Sabbath reunited. Uh, so if you're a Sabbath fan, you'll know how exciting that could have been. I think it was the fourth show in. They played a couple shows up in Scandinavia prior, and then they came and did their kind of hometown gig. And um, they played Spiral Architect and Sabbath Bloody Sabbath that night, which they dropped from the set list over the years. So um, that was definitely a highlight for me. Uh, another big one that I did that opened up a lot of doors, and if you know me or know anything about me, then you've heard me tell stories of this before, but uh, shooting the uh, Vector Tour Hub Festival. Uh, that was in 1993. I, I photographed this one a handful of times as well, but this particular one, uh, you can see my poster in the middle there, that list of bands is um, breathtaking. Really. It, was, uh, it was an incredible show. Uh, but it was the very, it wasn't the first time I'd seen the Tragically Hip, but it was the first time I photographed the Tragically Hip. Um, and so that, uh, that definitely was the, it kind of creaked the door open with the hip. I'll show you where the, t the, the door opened a little wider shortly. Um, partway through my career, uh, I was living in a, an apartment building in Toronto, and this is when we had fax machines. One morning, my fax machine went off before I was even awake. I thought, what is that? And so I went to see uh, the fax, and it was a fax from Christine Rayan asking if I wanted to come and make a presentation uh, to potentially be the, the photographer uh, for the, the venue they were about to open. And when I first got it, I thought, oh, I don't know, a casino photographer? I'm not sure if that's something I want to do. Um, but anyway, I went up there for the interview and thank, thank God I, I took that job because I've been photographing for them uh, um, for the Ontario Lottery and Gaming for over 20 years now. And uh, I've photographed over 1,600, 1,600 concerts for them and even more meet and greets. And I couldn't list all the bands. It's endless. Uh, uh, just so, so many bands. And the really great thing there is... Um, uh, the performers, it's pretty 
relaxed atmosphere in the sense uh, that I've been able to have conversations with a lot of the performers. And a lot of them are photographers or they're interested in photography. And uh, what's even more interesting, they don't want to talk about their music. They want to talk about photography. And it's kind of funny because in the back of my mind, I'm like, no, I want to talk about your music. Uh, but I always cooperate with the photography conversations and Don Felder, you can see him in the middle there. That that's definitely uh, one of the ones that's, who's a big photographer, Graham Nash from Crosby, Stills and Nash. There's a photo of him there on the bottom. Uh, you know, Ringo Starr, meeting Ringo Starr was, uh, uh, you know, meeting a Beatles, like seeing some rare animal in the woods or something that you don't see. Not a lot of people can say they met a beetle and, I actually brought a, a gift for Ringo. Um, this was uh, maybe the second time I met him. And uh, the gift was a photograph of his son. And if you know anything about Zach Starkey, you'll know that he is a mind blowing drummer. He's absolutely incredible. And so when I gave Ringo this picture, I said, oh, I, I brought you a gift. And, and, uh, and when he was looking at the picture, I go, he's, he's pretty much my favorite drummer. And Ringo immediately just looked up at me and, and he gave this look like, what do you mean? He's your favorite drummer. And I kind of tried to backpedal a little bit. And I'm like, oh, maybe my second favorite. He's like, nope, it's too late. You already said it. So uh, not only did I get to meet a Beatle, I got embarrassed in front of a Beatle. Uh, there's just a handful more from Casino Rama in, in Falls View Casino. Uh, yeah, geez, there's little Richard down in the bottom. But, you know, Man, we've lost some giants in the last few years. Uh, there's Dolly Parton. Just a quick story. Jeez, I'm already running out of time. Uh, I brought my mother to see Dolly Parton, and it was on her birthday. And my mom and I were sitting in the green room backstage, just minding our own business. And Dolly walked by, and she came in. And uh, she's just started talking to us. And I'm like, oh, I'm the photographer. And I said, this is my mom. And it's her birthday today. And immediately, Dolly just ignored me from that point forward. And she asked my mom what her name was, and my mom told her. And uh, Dolly sat right beside my mother and sang happy birthday to her and used her name in it. So uh, there you go. Every once in a while, the door opens wide. Um, geez, if I wanted to say thank you to all the people that really helped move me along through this career, it would sound like an Academy Awards. Thank you. Um, so I just had to pull one. And Chart Magazine is somebody I'll be eternally grateful for. Um, I literally shot hundreds and hundreds of concerts for them, if not over a thousand. Uh, and I photographed a lot of covers for them as well over the years. Uh, that's my, well, all these covers you see here will be mine and there's more. I just, I, I couldn't find them all. I was, I was going through all these boxes to scan them. Uh, but all of these, the, the, the great thing about working at Falls View or working at Chart, you do one thing and it opens up another door. And if you, you had given me three hours to talk. I could tell you about all these doors. Um, the, everything just opens up another door and brings you somewhere else. Kobe uh, opened up uh, a bunch of doors for me. Um, the photograph on the right, uh, I went over to England and I spent the day with Coldplay at their rehearsal studio when they were rehearsing for, oh geez, I think it was Rush of blood to the head or something. I forget the name of that album right now. And uh, just to be able to hang out in the studio with them while they're rehearsing was definitely a, a surreal moment. And as they were rehearsing, I would go over into the other room and set up different photo shoots. And then they would put their instruments down and photograph by me. And then they go back and jam. And um, yeah. So when they came back to Canada a couple of years later, um, I got hired again. And that's the shot on the left. And then we did this photograph. Uh, this was at a venue in Toronto called The Church. It's an old church that they've turned into this, um, this party venue. And uh, geez, I have a Coldplay story too that I tell all the time. Uh, I'll tell it in short form. But um, Chris and I found ourselves in the men room, men's room together. Wait, that sounds weird. Uh, I was, <laughs> he was in the men's room. Let me try that again. And I didn't realize he was in there. He was in one of the stalls and I was in there. Before I photograph any band, I often um, uh, really research the band and listen to all their music. And I was singing, you, you probably know their song called Yellow. And I was singing this song. I was belting the song out, not realizing that Chris was in the washroom at the same time partway through my falsetto of his singing, uh, he popped out of the urinal and uh, 
yeah, that was embarrassing. <laughs> More embarrassing moments. Um, maybe you got to look under the stall before you start singing someone's song. Uh, there's a handful of shows that I shot. Again, it, and there's Coldplay in there and Depeche Mode and Nine Inch Nails and Eric Clapton and Alice Cooper and the Foo Fighters and Cure and Macy Gray and Lenny Kravitz and Oasis and Pearl Jam. Man, it goes on and on in REM. It really has been incredible. Um, Marilyn Manson's always a good one. Uh, this is, uh, you know, same thing, big story, but I'll tell it in a sentence. He jumped off the stage and this was the time during Columbine and Marilyn was taking a lot of heat undeservedly um, for uh, what had happened in Columbine. And he was quite angry. You can see the scars on his body. He was, uh, it actually happened in one of the shows I was at. He was cutting himself on stage and it was, it was interesting to see that on stage. Anyway, he jumped off the stage that day and, um, for some reason, he decided to chase me, and I ran, and, ran. <laughs> and uh, I ran, and um, I outran Marilyn Manson, and at one point, he had to stop to sing, so I turned around and popped this photograph, and for years, I had no idea why I was chased by Marilyn Manson, and uh, uh, last year, I was reading The Guardian, a, a UK newspaper, and um, and there was a story in there where Marilyn said during that tour, he was randomly punching people because he was so frustrated, which, you know, in this day and age, it seems kind of bizarre. Anyway, it probably turns out that he, I was um, one of his targets. Fortunately, I can run faster than Marilyn Manson. Uh, two of the big ones, and, and we'll just get into these quickly, uh, Nickelback and uh, The Tragically Hip. Um, these were two chart magazine covers. I'd actually done a chart magazine cover with Nickelback prior to this, but this particular one really, really opened up a couple massive doors for me. And the same with the Tragically Hip one. So uh, we'll talk about those in a second. Uh, the Nickelback one, this was uh, right at the time, just before All the Right Reasons was released. And uh, All the Right Reasons is one that I do like to, I guess you could say brag about. Uh, it's sold over 19 million copies now. And uh, those are my photographs in there. And, you know, there's a lot of music photographers um, uh, uh, out there. And I don't think there's very many of them that can say that their photographs are in an album that have sold over 19 million copies because uh, there aren't a lot of albums that have sold that many copies. So, um, I guess it's kind of luck. There's some serendipity there. And it's the fact that Chad and the band wrote a really amazing album and uh, it touched a lot of people. And uh, they just did the re-release, the 15th anniversary uh, that just came out a couple days ago. And I would have been out there photographing the tour this summer um, if that didn't happen, uh, if COVID didn't happen. Uh, I've photographed them in concert a lot of times. Uh, they've taken me out on the road. I've gone across Canada with, with them. Uh, we actually did that in a day. That was an interesting one. Uh, you can see here that they give me incredible access. Uh, one of the things that you do when you work with these bands is you build up trust. And uh, they're not just letting anybody walk around the stage. The stage is a bit of a sacred place for bands. And... Um, uh, you know, Nickelback takes a lot of heat and I, I like to stick up for them. I, I don't really know why that is, but uh, let me tell you, they're great guys. Um, they're some of the, the most kind and generous uh, and collaborative people I've ever worked with. So whether you like their music or not, you can take it from me. They're, they're fantastic guys. They're just like friends that I grew up with uh, who happen to be um, massive rock stars. And all my friends are massive rock stars too. But uh, yeah, just more shows with Nickelback. Always great light show. They have pyro all the time. Uh, one of the shoots I did a couple of years ago, I just popped this in here uh, because I thought it would just give you an idea of how fun it is and, and being able to work and collaborate with a band. Uh, so I had this idea. This is the, uh, the, the end product of the idea and it ended up being used in the Feed the Machine album. Uh, but I knew that I had a photo shoot coming up with Nickelback. And so I was researching, even though I know everything already about them, but I still do the research. And the, the, on the left there, that's just a screenshot that I took off a YouTube video. And I was watching a bunch of videos of them. And you can see that primarily they're silhouetted and they're in dark in that video. And it just occurred to me that Nickelback, it, they're so famous that you don't need to see their faces. So I, I went back there. I went back to Vancouver for a different shoot. And I said, you know, you guys, you're, you're, you have so iconic of moves and the way that you look. We don't need to see your faces. Let's just photograph you as a silhouette. And they went, 
well, yeah, that's a great idea. So on the right, that's me um, goofing around uh, with uh, my assistant, Emily. Um, she's photographing me and we set up a, a studio or we set up the studio at Lambton College. And I did kind of a mock idea of what I wanted to do with the band. And I sent this out to them and uh, I said, this is what I want to do. What do you think? And uh, they said, yeah, yeah, that's a great idea. So I went out to Vancouver and, um, but red was the primary color that was part of the album, part of the artwork. And so we changed the colors to red and then we did the shoot and, and it was fantastic. And it ended up being used all over the world. It was on t-shirts and posters. And you can see here, my, my friend, uh, Andrea, uh, from Austria sent me a Japanese tour poster up in the top left. And then all of this stuff on the right is from uh, Las Vegas. Um, Nickelback was doing a, uh, a residency at the, the joint, the Hard Rock Casino in Las Vegas. So they deployed me out there to cover some of the, um, the residency. And when I got to the hotel, you can see the woman in the top right. She's checking me into the hotel. And when I got into the hotel, everybody was wearing my photograph on the t-shirts and I had no idea. And so I actually snuck this photograph of this woman and like, seriously, every single person that worked in the casino was wearing this shirt. And so I was trying to buy one off people. And I think they just thought I was some weird person. And I would say, no, no, I'm the photographer. And nobody believed me. No word of a lie. Everyone just thought maybe I was drinking or something. Um, and I couldn't get a photograph. And then if you look in this middle shot here where I'm standing in front of the banner, that was actually a VIP private party. And I went up to, there was two security guards there. And I said, do you mind if I go in there and take a photograph in front of that massive picture? Because that's my photograph. And they wouldn't let me in. They said, no, you, you have to be a VIP. And I'm like, well, I kind of am, but <laughs> it didn't matter. They weren't letting me in. Finally, I, I said, just, 30 seconds. I just want to photograph. I don't want to go to the party. They finally let me in. Um, anyway, you can see here that it's on the elevator in the bottom right. And it's over here on the parking lot. Like that's a parking lot on the bottom left. It was massive. They were all over the place. I couldn't get a shirt. No one would give me a shirt. And um, so I went home and I complained about it on my social media. And I'm like, I told the story. I just told you on social media. And finally, I think someone just to shut me up sent me a shirt um, in the mail. So I'm forever grateful that I actually got a shirt finally with my picture on it. So that's a funny story. So let's talk about the hip here. Uh, the hip, um, geez, it goes on and on and on. And uh, like probably all of you, uh, losing Gord uh, was a, a hard moment. And uh, I had a lot of incredible experiences with the Tragically Hip. Uh, this wasn't my first shoot with them, but it was my first kind of cover shoot. Uh, that's Jose Contreras on the left. Uh, he's from the band By Divine Right when the hill going out on the, oh God, the Phantom Power Tour. Um, By Divine Right was the opening act. So I went in there and we photographed this, uh, this cover for Chart Magazine. While I was doing that cover, that, the, the cover photograph, I, that's inside the horseshoe. Uh, down at Queen and Spadina in Toronto. We had the horseshoe for the day, which was really cool. It was overcast outside, so we went outside and I, uh, I thought, well, why don't we just do a shot outside? And this shot of Gord on the left, um, which has probably become my most well-known photograph um, all the years, uh, really, we were just getting ready. I was just doing a test shot and uh, this photograph happened. And um, when I got the negatives back, I was looking through them. And honestly, I looked in the negatives and nothing really jumped out at me. And then I'd showed it to uh, the negatives to a couple other people. And they're like, that's your shot. That's your shot. And everyone kept picking up the shot. And then I took it to the management and uh, same thing. They're like, wow, look at that shot. And so uh, they ended up using it for publicity. Uh, it's been used for publicity forever. When Gord um, died, it actually ended up being used by TSN and the NHL and uh, McLean's and I, mind you, no one asked permission. So it was, uh, you know, it was kind of a mixed blessing. Uh, obviously I was happy that it was being used and that it was representing Gord and, uh, but you know, the, the internet's a funny place to be these days. Uh, the tragically hip, um, forever grateful. I photographed them uh, over a hundred times. Uh, uh, Woodstock 99 was a big one. That shot of Gord lying on the tracks was definitely a, another one of the shots that's one of my better known photographs of the tragically hip. 
I was out at the Olympics with them in 2002, and that was incredibly exciting because that's when the men and the women's hockey team had won the gold. Uh, so um, it was kind of fun being a Canadian in America at that time um, because we'd won the two major medals and the tragically hit played in the Olympics. Uh, yeah, there you go. Um, out on tour all across Canada, over in Europe, uh, the United States. I've photographed them a lot of times. Um, and they always gave me this very um, fly on the wall access. You can see up in the top left there, you know, before they, they, they would cordon off a, a room in whatever venue they're playing just so they could rehearse and jam and probably write some songs. And I had that sort of access. Uh, so I would just quietly step in there and you can see that they're just talking, jamming. Uh, the middle shots, Vancouver, that was the first time I'd ever been on the stage with the Tragic Lip. And in fact, I think it was the first time I was on the stage with any massive band. And uh, I was terrified <laughs> having 20,000 people looking down, even though I know they're looking at the band, no matter what, you feel self-conscious when you're standing in the open like that. Uh, yeah, just more, um, that middle shot is another one that's uh, one of my more known photographs of Gord. And of course, the final tour, uh, photograph nine show the final tour. Uh, I was invited to do the entire tour, but uh, I had other commitments, so I couldn't make it to every single show. It was um, a very emotional uh, tour for sure. Uh, and anybody that saw any of those final shows um, can attest to that. But I found even more so out in Vancouver, like uh, I could even see the band, you could see emotion welling up in the band uh, early in the tour. Um, and then coming out here, uh, it was really cool. I was with a bunch of my friends at all the different shows and uh, I was able to create some very uh, great photographs and uh, again it was just moving sorry I'm even staring at these photographs thinking about uh, how much that band meant to me and how much Gord Downey meant to me and um, just all the great experiences working with him and uh, fortunately I was able to uh, do album photography for the Tragically Hip and do album photography for Gord Downey's solo record and uh, my my photograph or his the artwork we did for one of his solo records was nominated for a Juno. So myself and the, um, uh, the people that put the artwork together were nominated for that Juno. Uh, so a lot of incredible experiences came out of working with the hip. Uh, I'm pretty much wrapped up here. I just thought I would kind of promote uh, myself at the end here. If you are on Facebook, which I'm not really on Facebook. So if you send me a message on there, uh, bear with me because I don't really know my way around there that well. Uh, but you can find me at Richard Bland Photography Incorporated. Instagram, I'm much better with. Uh, I didn't really know much about Instagram three or four years ago. In fact, I didn't even know what a hashtag was. I thought Instagram was a video game for the longest time. Uh, but I'm pretty active on there now. And uh, so if you want to check out Instagram, uh, my website. And... Uh, if you're looking for a unique Christmas present for your loved ones, uh, I do have a, a fine art print, um, a selection of prints that I sell as uh, fine art. And uh, they're all numbered and signed and limited edition. And um, lastly, don't forget, we're, we have an amazing photography program at Lambton College. And uh, if you're ever interested in studying uh, the two-year diploma program or uh, even part-time, um, uh, you can contact me, feel free to contact me anytime and I can give you information on that. So Dana, uh, I turn that over to you now. Did I stop sharing my screen? You did stop sharing your screen. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much. That was awesome. And, um, we have gotten some questions from, um, from our webinar participants. So, okay. um, first question, have you worked any film shoots or with IASTE? IATSE. Uh oh! If you belong I to, to IATSE, <laughs> well, IATSE is a, a a union. So if that person that asked that question belongs to IATSE, they might not like the answer. But yes, I have worked as a stills photographer on a lot of video shoots. I don't belong to IATSE. Everything I've ever done was uh, for the band, so it actually wasn't for a union. Uh, but yeah, I, I mean, I was on the Rush video. I've been on a, a Tragically Hip videos, um, Boys to Men. Um, Nelly Furtado, 
geez, I can't remember them all right now, but uh, when I lived in Toronto, um, when I was there more often, uh, I, I would be a video stills photographer. And that's amazing work. I loved it. So yes, I have. I guess I could have just said yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we got this question twice, so people really want to know. I'm going to answer uh, it twice. Who is an artist you haven't shot that you want to shoot in the future? Do they have to be alive? Uh, Jimi Hendrix. Yeah. <laughs> they have to be alive. Uh, Geez, I, I always say this, if, if, if I could do a photo shoot with anybody um, that's alive, uh, Neil Young, I, I just would love to be able to do an actual portrait of Neil Young. So Neil, if you're listening, <laughs> uh, yeah, Neil Young, that would be my number one. I, I just think he's got that face, he's got the stories, he's got the history. Uh, yeah, I would love to photograph Neil Young. Just give me five minutes even. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, and this is a more technical question. What type of camera and lenses would you predominantly carry for a concert shoot? Well, if you know me, you know that I'm a Nikon shooter. We often have fun little spars over Nikon and Canon. Uh, but I, I shoot uh, Nikon. I have a D4, I have a Z7, I have a D3. Those are my bodies. Um, when I'm farther back from the stage, I have a 300 millimeter, a 2.8, which is a, a beautiful lens. I bought it years and years and years ago, and I've taken good care of it because it's a very expensive lens. Um, and then I have a range of lenses. If I'm up closer, I, you know, I have a 17 to uh, 17 to 40. I have a uh, 80 to 200 to 70 to 200. So I, I, I really, honestly, I have the whole range um, because you never know where you're going to photograph from, and you never know. Um, you know, when you have stage access, for example, maybe you want something wider so you can get the entire crowd. Uh, so yeah, I have a whole range going up to 300 millimeters and I even have a teleconverter. So if I'm really far back, I can throw this teleconverter on, it makes it a 420. So I can get pretty close even from far back. How's that? Well, thank you. Good question. Um, next question. How does one become a venue photographer and how is it possible to gain photo access to a venue? Hmm. Well, a venue photographer, let me tell you how I became the first venue photographer. Uh, one of the very first jobs when I first moved to Toronto, you know, when you start out, there's not a lot of money. I worked as an usher uh, at Roy Thompson Hall in, in Toronto. And, you know, I kind of let it leak that I was a photographer. Uh, so I would wear my little, bow tie and the vest that they supply you with and I'd show people to their seats uh, and eventually I, I was able to start being the venue photographer for Roy Thompson Hall and Massey Hall and I was a, an usher there for ages I, I actually really loved that job and the only reason I quit that job is because one night um, and this is after I'd done a number of work with the Tragically Hip uh, a gentleman came up and handed me his ticket and I looked up and it was Gord Downey and uh, it was just kind of an awkward moment because here I was photographing them not that long ago in, in a proper photo shoot. And now I'm showing him to his seat. So anyway, uh, that's how I became a venue photographer there. Um, working as a venue photographer at Falls View, that all happened through that fax. Uh, I think you just want to get your name out there without pushing your name out there. And eventually, as long as your name is attached to some good words like dependable, uh, being versatile, uh, you know, being trust they, they can trust you. I think eventually that kind of just builds into something bigger. And, uh, you know, if you go to Toronto, there's going to be 20 photographers that your name will be listed with. But if you're the lucky one that gets the one that they chose of all those names or choose of all those names, then you just get in a position to get the work, I guess. Um, but being dependable and is the number one thing, you know, you, you got to show up and you got to be on time and dress the part and be the part. So sorry, long answer. Um, that's how. <laughs> that's great. Thank you. Work. Work hard. Work hard. So will you ever do an exhibit with your life's work? Absolutely. Uh, I did an exhibit, geez, it's a number of years ago now. To put together an exhibit, it's a lot of work. And uh, I, I don't like to do anything kind of halfway. I don't want to do an exhibit at a coffee shop or something like that. And no offense to coffee shops. I just, if I do something, I want to do it bigger. And I have been picking away at something 
um, for probably 18 months now. I was supposed to have an opening this June and then COVID came. Uh, I was supposed to have an opening out in Alberta and then another one in Toronto right about now. And uh, we decided that it just wasn't worth pursuing. Um, so there will be an exhibition, but we need to clear this up. So wear your mask so we can get rid of this COVID business. <laughs> yeah, so. that's right. Let's get live music back. Exactly. Jeez. Um, okay. Questions are still coming in. So uh, would you ever venture from music photography to other types, maybe even videography? Well, let's stick with photography just for a second. For sure. I'll photograph. Uh, there's lots of subjects I will photograph as long as I think I'm capable. Um, I, I, I'm not interested in photographing weddings, for example. And it's not because I don't like weddings or wedding photographers. I just think there's someone out there that can do it much better than me. But uh, I love architecture. So real estate photography is something that interests me. Uh, so certainly if I can get out there and, and make a living with my camera, I'm very happy to do so. Uh, videography certainly interests me. And in fact, I spent two hours with somebody this morning uh, just getting some tips on videography. So I am in the, in, the, uh, in the shadows learning some videography right now as we speak. But I'm anything. I, I just love getting out there and making photographs. I would prefer to photograph musicians, uh, but I'm certainly not limiting myself. Um, do you focus manually? <laughs> what do they say after you turn 40? I'm wearing glasses. I, I didn't wear glasses all my life. Uh, no, I use autofocus now. My eyes, uh, they're just not good enough. If I was in the studio, certainly I could pay attention and I could photograph without glasses, but uh, I use autofocus. I don't use manual focus any longer. I think after you turn 40, you get glasses. <laughs> do you get nerd? Do you get nervous or wonder if you'll be able to pull it off, especially with famous acts? Um, well, let me tell you, I used to. I was terrified for like the first five years. I was really, really nervous. And I always tell this story about when I photographed Slash, I did a, a photo shoot with the guitar player from Guns N' Roses. And I was physically shaking. And Slash, he, he had a bottle of jack daniels in his room and he said do you want to drink of that and i said oh man i never drink on the job and thank you anyway and my assistant came and whispered in my ear he's like you should take a drink you're shaking and everyone can see it i, I never did take the drink um i don't really get nervous anymore and it it's not you know they say oh if you're nervous it means you care and i care trust me i care but i'm i'm a little more in the groove that i know there's a job to do and i feel more confident now um, so I'm not as nervous as I used to be. I used to be, I would pray for rain, please rain. I don't want to do this photo shoot. Even though after I do the shoot, I was always happy I did it. Um, but I would, I've just, Oh, I was so scared, but no, I'm not anymore. Um, I showed that picture of Tony Bennett when I sat in Tony Bennett's, uh, uh dressing room with them that particular day, I was nervous. I knew I was in the presence of a giant and it kind of, I got worked up about it. Uh, but no, normally I, try to just talk to them like we're talking now so no yes i used to i don't know um have you ever turned down a gig that you later regretted oh wow not really i went through this phase you know you're young and you're arrogant and i went through this phase where i would only photograph bands that i really liked which is silly now i think about it but I, there was this point at Chart Magazine where they would send out a list of bands every month that were coming to play live. And fortunately, I was the first one on the list because I'd spent the longest at Chart Magazine. So I usually got the, the, the cream of the crop. And I would only, for a, a stretch, I would choose bands that I really was a fan of. Um, so, no, I never turned anything down, but I may have missed out on something that because of, I, I call it arrogance, but I just thought, I don't know, I, I'm not a fan. <laughs> um, this is an interesting question, two part question. What okay. is your favorite concert venue in Canada and in the world? Oh, wow. Well, to see a concert in Canada, 
well, Massey Hall, as long as you're not in that upper balcony, if you're in the upper balcony at Massey Hall, it's not a very comfortable seat because you're really like your, your knees are against the guy behind in front of you. Um, but if you're on that lower, the best seat in Canada, in my opinion, is dead center in Massey Hall, the front row of the balcony. You cannot beat that. It's like having the band in your backyard. Um, I think the greatest venue that I've ever been in, I'm going to name two or three, but the greatest one is right across the river at the Fox Theater in Detroit. It is gorgeous. If you've never been in there, you have to go to see anything because that venue is beautiful. Um, Royal Albert Hall, and, and it's almost cliche to say that one, but uh, in London, England, it's incredible. And um, the Paradiso in, in Amsterdam, there's just a vibe in there. It's an old church uh, and everyone has played there at some point. And um, there's a vibe in there that you can't get anywhere else. So there's my three. Um, did you ever have a bad shoot? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I've, uh, yeah, I mean, we, we, we had this experience with Art Garfunkel from Simon and Garfunkel. Uh, Art wanted me to do a shoot. He was, you know, for two days, he was the kindest man in the world. And, uh, we set up this shoot. He wanted to photograph after the concert. Um, so we set up this big shoot and uh, it was about 1130 at night. We started the shoot and Art was in the most ornery mood you could ever imagine. And he was not a nice man. And uh, I soldiered through it. I did my job, but he did not treat my assistant and I very well. And the very next day, Art Garfunkel called me on my cell phone. Um, and geez, I here's a regret. I screened his call because <laughs> I thought I was at the college at the time about to teach. No, I was about to go visit my dean. And um, I was really upset from the night before because art really was not very nice that night. And he left, I can't remember how long it was, but for sure it was 10 minutes. He left a 10 minute apology on my phone, which I still have. I recorded it. And I was just going over to my dean at the time. I'm like, you never believe who just called me. And, um, so yeah, that was a bad shoot. Although I did get good photographs, um, but it wasn't very comfortable. And um, uh, anyway, does I don't have to tell the rest of the story, but Art Garfunkel, that was probably my most challenging shoot. Is if that you could, two part? Sorry, I missed the next part. Nope, that was it, just a bad shoot. Um, if you could say one thing to future photographers, what would you tell them? <laughs> Put your couch on Kijiji. Um, what I mean by that is, I always say that to the students. Honestly, if, this just sounds cliche as well, but if you really want to get out there and, and make it, you have to be motivated. You, you can't wait for the phone to ring. And I mean, my neighbor said to me the other day, he's like, do you never not take photographs? Uh, go shoot the sunset, like photograph anything, practice, practice, practice. Uh, you, you just, you, I mean, look at these musicians or look at hockey players. They don't put their hockey sticks down. They don't put their guitars down. They play every single day. Um, not that I'm equating myself with, you know, a, an amazing hockey player or amazing guitar player. But th the point is, if you want to become really good at something, you have to practice it every day. And, and I'm not making it up when I say that I still use my camera every day, even if it's just using your telephone. So be motivated, practice. Don't put your camera down. Uh, study. Go to class. Like you can learn photography on the internet, and I've been saying this long before I worked at Lambda College. A formal education will put you ahead of that pack. There's a lot of people out there that want to work as a photographer, um, and you have to find a way to to get above the mass of people that just go to Best Buy and buy the very best camera they can afford, and and they're your competition initially. So. Sorry, long answer again, but be motivated and get a formal education. That two years will save your butt because you, you might learn to do one thing really well, but you need to do 30 things really well because you never know what position you're going to be in and you can't let the client see sweat rolling down your forehead. You have to be able to succeed all the time. So sorry, long answer. Good one though. Okay. Um, follow up about glasses. You were talking about earlier. Um, do you shoot wearing your glasses? <laughs> I do. I do. One of my friends teases me about that too, but 
There's a diopter on your camera. If anybody owns a, an expensive camera, I'll know there's a diopter there. And you just set the diopter to your camera, or to your, your uh, glasses. I actually proposed to my eye doctor one time, just cut a little piece of glass out of my glasses and I'll pop it in my viewfinder. But they told me that that wasn't, they couldn't do that or something. So <laughs> I thought that would be a great idea. Yes, I wear my glasses. Um, and how long do you generally keep camera or equipment? Do you need the latest and greatest or do you have favorites that you keep for years? Uh, I wouldn't say it's like a guitar or something where you kind of, it, starts to mold to your hands and the fretboard, you know, you wear it down to the, the way you play. But um, I definitely use my equipment as long as you can. Uh, I like to get to know my equipment. So it's kind of an extension of my, my arm. Um, my D4, my D3, geez, it's, I don't even know. It's over 10 years, 20, 15 years old, maybe. So yeah, I keep my equipment as long as possible. I have all my lenses um, and I tell my students and I tell everyone you, you pay some lenses are over a thousand dollars. Some of them are several thousand. You want to look after them. So yeah, I still have all my equipment. Um, I use it until the very end and then I do upgrade eventually. Um, have you ever got a chance to photograph the Ramones? Yeah, I, it, Richard, Richard Dot Bland on my Instagram. I posted Johnny Ramone today. Um, I photographed the Ramones a, a number of times. I got to meet all of them. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm a huge fan of the Ramones. That makes me excited. But uh, it's Johnny Ramone's birthday today. Um, as you know, he's no longer with us, but it's actually his birthday. And I believe it's CJ Ramone's birthday today as well. So I, I probably photographed the Ramones um, five or six times. Yeah. Um, so two kind of connected questions. Do you play music during your studio shoots? Um, and what kind of music do you like to listen to, not necessarily photograph? Uh, yeah, I mean, we always bring music on set. Um, certainly, I think it kind of gets everyone in the mood. Um, I try to choose the music for what band is with us, you know, like a you know, I don't know. I don't have to say anything what music we play, but we would choose music that would get people amped up and excited and kind of builds a mood. You know what it's like. You got music playing in your house. Uh, what music do I listen to when I'm not? Uh, everything. Jeez, my, my musical taste is really open. Uh, these days in the car, the last two days, I've been listening to Van Halen pretty much exclusively. Uh, there's a Van Halen tribute station on Sirius Radio. Um, I listen to U2 a lot. I find that that really does put me in a good mood. Uh, but, you know, I throw on Metallica in the car. I throw on Motorhead in the car. I throw on Led Zeppelin. Uh, it just depends on the mood. Black Sabbath, the new ACDC song, and then the new ACDC album will be out soon. Out in the dark. Yeah, you got it. That's yeah. good. Bring it on. We need new music. That's right. Especially yeah. in 2020. Oh, my. Um, so this is a comment from Wayne. He says, hey, Richard, way back when you and I and some other friends went to Rich Stadium in Buffalo, I mm. believe it's called, in 1986 or around that time, you snuck a camera in and we saw the Grateful Dead, Bob Dylan and Tom Petty. Uh, did you ever get to work with any of those bands? Well, that was the very, maybe Wayne jumped in later on because that was the very first slide that I showed. Uh, did I ever get to work with? Well, I photographed Jerry Garcia and the Grateful Dead uh, a bunch of times over the years. And uh, if you know me, you know that I saw them play in concert a lot of times. Uh, Tom Petty, I photographed, um, geez, I don't know, probably five or six times as well. And Bob Dylan, I've seen him in concert a bunch of times, but I only photographed him twice. Bob was a real stickler. He didn't like people making photographs of him. So uh, I never worked with any of them directly, but I photographed all of them um, for different uh, publications, different editorial magazines. Cool. Hi, Wayne. Um, just a couple more questions. I know we're almost at eight o'clock. Um, so how many pictures do you take at an average show and how many do you keep? Hmm. Well, that's a, a question that has changed over the years. Um, you, well, you know, I've been shooting for a long time. So when I was shooting with film, it's kind of funny because maybe you would shoot anywhere from two rolls to on the outside, 10 rolls, 36 frames of roll. So let's say we're on the outside, quick math, 360 photographs. Nowadays with digital, 
I could shoot 800 shots, maybe 700. I am not a guy that hits the burst button. And in fact, I don't really like that type of photography. Uh, I, I, I don't feel like you're really paying attention if you're just bursting. However, if you burst, I don't mean to insult you. Uh, usually out of a shoot, I'll just narrow it down to 20 shots that I think are good. And ultimately, there will only be two or something that I really think kind of rise to the top. How's that? Uh, who's the most exciting new band that you'd like to photograph? Oh, what do you call them? Glorious Sons. <laughs> My neighbor Craig turned me onto the Glorious Sons and him and I went to see them. And uh, uh, yeah, what a great band. And they're just full of energy. And, they, you know, they're part of the Tragically Hip family kind of. Uh, so yeah, the Glorious Sons. How about that? I'd like to do a shoot with them. And I certainly would love to photograph them in concert. Yeah. Um, and what mic are you using? Right now? I don't know. Yeah. I got it. I bought it off of Amazon. Let's check it out. Oh, Audio Technica. Why does it sound good? Apparently, someone's <laughs> Auto Tech Audio Technica. You could email me, and I could give you the link. I got it from e, um, not eBay, Amazon. Okay, they say yeah, it sounds good. Excellent. Um, All right. It was only a hundred dollars. I guess related question: Can you recommend where to buy good used equipment? Camera equipment. Uh, well, you can go to Henry's, you can go to Camera Canada uh, in, in London, talk to my friend Kadar there. Kadar is really great. He's been supportive of our program for years. Um, uh, VizTech in Toronto is an amazing store. Mind you, you kind of need to know what you're talking about there because they, it's kind of a professional store in the sense. So they, exp I don't want to undermine it, but you need to know what you're talking about at VizTech. Uh, if you if you're more of a prosumer, I would go to Henry's in London. Uh, it's another great store, or Camera Canada, and tell Kadar I sent you. He's a good guy. All right. Well, it's just after eight o'clock. Um, was there anything else you wanted to to share with us before we shut it down? Um, well, I just want to say thank you. I I think I said this at the beginning, but in case someone jumped in on the end, I know time is valuable. And I really appreciate the fact that you just spent an hour listening to me. Um, and I also want to say thank you to you, Dana, and thank you to the Lampton Heritage Museum. Uh, the fact that you asked me to be one of four, um, truly, it's an honor. I, I'm really, really, um, I'm, I was really excited and nervous in the beginning. So <laughs> thank you kindly. I'm, I don't take these kind of things lightly. I'm very grateful for the opportunity. Well, thank you for being with us tonight. I'm glad we could still uh, go ahead with this and turn it into a digital webinar instead of an in-person lecture. So, um, yeah, we've been talking about this for a year, haven't we? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> oh, wow, <laughs> I forgot about that. So, um, our our next uh, digital lecture will be the second Thursday in November, and um, we're hosting Nicole Azalis from the Lambton County Archives, she's the archivist there, and she's going to be talking about preserving your family history pictures. So a bit of a, uh, a different perspective, but still in the, the field of photography. So hopefully um, you can join us for that. And uh, thank you everyone for coming tonight. And thank you, Richard, for being with us. Thank you very much. Have a great night, everybody. Yeah, good night, everyone. Ciao, ciao.